next speaker. Uh, our next speaker, Professor Nestor Medina, is a, um, a, a new colleague of mine here at a confederation of theological colleges called the Toronto School of Theology. Um, Nestor is uh, one of the very first people when I got this position about a year ago <clears throat> that I was really excited to get to know and uh, learn a bit about his work because uh, he writes on really, really interesting topics on the intersection of race and uh, decolonization and ethics. And these are all topics that are really dear to my heart. So I was really pleased to see that Nestor would be uh, a colleague of mine. So uh, Professor Nestor Medina is Assistant Professor of Religious Ethics at Emmanuel College here at the Toronto School of Theology. Um, as I mentioned, he does all sorts of contextual and liberation theology. Uh, and in particular, the reason that we wanted to have him come and speak at this conference is that he teaches a class here uh, called uh, Ethics, Colonization, and Care of the Planet, where he sort of brings all these topics into conversation, um, a class that he'll be teaching next year. He's the author of a ton of um, publications, a really impressive and intimidating set of publications, if I may say, but um, his most recent book is called Christianity, Empire, and the Spirit, uh, published by Brill Press in 2018. And the title of his talk this morning is called Senti Pensando Ecological Debates. What does race have to do with environmental concerns? So would you welcome Professor Medina and we're really glad to have you here today. Go for it. Thanks, uh, Justin. Um, good, well, should I say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the globe. Um, it is in my pleasure to be with you. Um, my hope is that I will um, address some of the issues and concerns that you, be, you have been uh, touching on during your conference or that you, you hope to be touching on in the near future. My presentation today, I'm going to do it in the form of a lecture. I hope that's all right. And, and what I intend to do is really comes out of uh, my few years of, of researching uh, these concerns. And so uh, without going too far into any more stuff, uh, I'm just going to start sharing my screen, OK? And if you don't mind telling me um, whether you can see that, um, that would be fantastic. Yes, sir, we can see it. Great, thank you. Yeah. yeah, as you all know, when you share, you kind of lose track where people are, so. All right, so just to repeat, um, the presentation of today is Senti Pensando Ecological Debates. What does race have to do with environmental concerns? But before I do that, the first thing I want to uh, do is acknowledge the land of which I am a guest and the land from which I come. On one hand, I engage in this practice, not because it is the popular thing to do here in Canada, but because it locates my own sense of space. It helps define all my relationships. It gives me, a, and it gives me a sense of connectedness to the land as well as my ancestors some of whom were of Mayan descent. So I acknowledge that I come to you from the lands of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, the Haudenosaunee, and the Mississaugas of the Credit River. This territory where I am a guest is the subject of the dish with one spoon wampum belt, which was a treaty between the Anishinaabe, the Mississaugas, and the Haudenosaunee that bound them together to share the territory and protect the land. The city of Toronto, where I live, discovered by Treaty 13. I am also original from Guatemala, from the land of Aviayala, which means land in full maturity by the indigenous Kuna people. My grandfather was of Mayan descent. So there, the acknowledgement of the land where I come from is interconnected with acknowledgement of one's ancestors. So as I told you, I wanna do three things. Uh, uh, but before that, 
I want to affirm a couple of uh, three things, actually. The first thing I want to do is affirm the land as an entity and not as a commodity. I want to say to you along the way that the land is irreducible to property or as a resource to be extracted. The second thing that I want to affirm to you is my ancestors. And here, I not only mean those who've gone before, but also those that are yet to come. This affirmation brings the responsibility of what I must do today that has direct implications for subsequent generations. And the third thing I want to do is affirm my relationships, my relations. And this one has two sides. The first one is that it refers to all those who contributed to create the conditions for our gathering today. It includes our families, as well as those who produce the food and the goods which we consume to make it possible for to live our lives. In an online environment, which is where we, you know, the, the waters begin to get muddied, it also includes considerations of the role of computers and how they are the result of mining and polluting of communities and how by participating in these meetings, we also become complicit with the violence this communities experience. And the second thing is that the question of language of relations upholds all forms of lives and not only human life. This second aspect brings with it an ethical imperative responsibility of lessening our footprint in the world in order to reduce environmental suffering and violence. Now, as you might have noticed already, I'm beginning with the land and with all our relations, because I believe that environmental issues are, at the end of the day, land issues. I also believe that environmental issues are part of the larger network of relations that entangle all of us. So as I told you, I wish to do three things. I don't know, for some reason, maybe this is a leftover Trinitarian Christian background that, that I, everything I'm doing is in threes, but, but I'm, a, I'm, gonna, I'm about to get out of there. Uh, there are four things that I'm doing, one of which I already did, and that is the land acknowledgement. But the next three points that I wish to do, I want to first briefly recap or bring to mind what we're talking about when we speak about environmental concerns, especially when we talk about issues of environmental racism. The critical question that I want to point to you is what does race have to do with debates, of the, with debates on the environment? So here I'm going to provide a whole series of images. So this is the longer section of this, of this presentation. In the next aspect, what I want to do is connect environmental issues with questions of racism more intentionally. I want to propose to you that issues of environmental racism are part of the legacy of imperialism and colonization or colonialism, and that they remain alive and well through a coloniality of race. And the third thing that I wish to do is that I want to offer to you some important insights that we can learn from communities in the global south and how their proposal undercut the logic of coloniality for their own communities. And those can be useful framework for our own environmental justice work. Does that sound about a lot of fun? Let's go, let's go there then. So let's start with a little recap. And this is gonna feel to you like a like a roller coaster in terms of the amount of stuff that I'm going to bring out. We are all familiar with global warming and its accompanying expressions across the world. From an increasing number and scope of heat waves to an extension of the hurricane season, to, to an acknowledgement of the melting of the polar ice caps, to the rising of sea levels, to the submersion, to the submersion of islands, the drying up of rivers and the water crises around the world, 
to the rapid increase in deforestation or of deforestation to the expansion of deserts, soil erosion, and increase of droughts. This reality of environmental crises has contributed to the expansion and emerging emergence of ap apocalyptic sentiments that in, that about impending cataclysmic events. The rapid changes we are witnessing, even the idea that we are at the 11th hour have provoked many to speak of a post-human era, what others are calling the Anthropocene. This cultural hysteria has been present in the media for some time now, and we can see it in the movies, for example. At the level of what can be done and what is being done, the most industrialized nations are insisting that the reduction of carbon emissions and fossil fuels is a key part of the solution. And some countries claim they are working hard to wean themselves from fossil fuels. Those same countries also claim they are seeking for ways to eradicate contaminants and toxic weights. Unfortunately, those are deeply interwoven in our very social fabric and modes of consumption. It is hard to think of anything with which we come into contact that does not potentially contain an environmental pollutant or can harm our health. So let me give you some of them. And if you have some other ones, I invite you to note them on the chat. For example, your shampoo or the soaps or other products we use for personal care. The materials we use for construction in our buildings, in our homes. The chemicals that are used in hospitals. You will recall that hospitals became breeding ground for many virus or are breeding ground for many virus and that during the COVID situation, hospitals were some of the most unsafe places. <laughs> And when it comes to avoiding COVID. And also the pesticides that are used in farming. The caveat here is that a careful look helps us better appreciate how the social, economic, and political structures in richer nations and the present geopolitical context are designed to make racialized people and the majority world to shoulder the responsibilities of dealing with negative or the negative effects of environmental destruction. Food, produce, and products that richer nations consume often happen at the expense of the very lives of the racialized and minoritized people. For example, many shampoo and soap companies have manufacturing facilities in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Many of the chemicals that are produced in the global north for the global north have also been manufactured in the global south, for example, laboratories, and return to the global south in the form of chemical waste to those poorer nations. In the case of many of the pesticides that are used for agriculture, even in the global north, it is often racialized people, seasonal farmers, and crop pickers or pro crop picking workers who end up being first exposed and often develop illnesses and end up dying because of them. It is estimated that as many as 25 million agricultural workers worldwide experience quote, uh, quotation marks here, unintentional pesticide poisoning. Additionally, the produce that ends up in the food shelves of our supermarkets and that we consume often come from countries where some of the pesticides that are not allowed in the global north are used without regulation. But this is where it starts getting a little bit meaty for me. One critical piece, often undetected, is how richer countries are attempting to make plastic disappear. 
especially single-use plastic, say bags, straws, bottles. Until 2018, exporting of mixed plastic ended up in China. Since the acceptance of exported plastic has been banned there because the Chinese government concluded that the environmental impact was not worth the financial compensation, the exporting of plastic has now re been redirected towards Africa, and there it has quadrupled. I don't know if you know this, but I am reminded that although India banned single-use plastic as of July at first this year, there is no way to know when they will actually ban the import of mixed plastic from the global north. Greenpeace reports that since the closing of China's borders for exporting of plastic, Thailand, Malaysia, and Vietnam have become the desired destination for exporting of foreign waste. In, the Vietnam, in Vietnam, there are already plans in motion to ban export of plastics. And so here I decided to just uh, show you this, the trajectory of some of the plastic that, in, that comes out of the global north and where it ends, and the kind of trajectory it takes in order to get to its destination. And so here you can see 141 shipping containers leaving Hamburg, Germany, and going around in multiple different places, and hopefully someday ending up in Vietnam. So the more I pay attention to these issues, it almost seems like a competition, not about who produces less plastic waste, but about who gets to produce and export at the most waste. And as you can see there, um, just because you're here, the UK is way up there, still there, holding its own in terms of exporting plastic waste. So oftentimes, conversations about park benches and, and outdoor furniture and asphalt and bricks to build homes and traffic cones and highway dividers, count kitchen countertops and carpet rugs, all and workout apparel, all those kinds of things are often sold out as the alternatives to fix this mess. But I want to suggest to you that those are only scratching the surface of a much bigger issue. Out of sight, moving a little bit away from plastic, out of sight also remain the growing hundreds of millions of metric tons of toxic waste buried yearly and which eventually will leak out and seep into the waterways. For the richer nations, in their failure to achieve their targets, and while they speak, in fact, recently, the UK spoke about net zero emissions by 2050. What happens in reality is that the poorer nations become the responsible agents to deal with their waste. Much of that toxic waste is being export, exported to the poorer nations because, because it is an economically sound alternative as well as it helps give the impression the global north is in fact addressing the problem of environmental contamination, of production of plastic, and the reduction of environmental footprint. There are three sides, of course, three side effects of this exporting of chemical issue, chemicals for poorer nations. There are many more, but the one, the three that I want to mention is that poorer nations become the dumpsters for disposing of hazardous material because the richer nations are unwilling to deal with or to stop producing their materials at the risk of slowing down their economic growth. For example, Bangladesh has 79,000 tons of asbestos and 210 thousand ton, tons of ozone depleting substances, all of them stockpile 
from the global west, from the global north. In Nigeria, received 4,000 tons of toxic waste shipped there and simply dumped. The second, hey, I just noticed I have three implications. Hey, another three. Anyway, the, the, the second aspect that I want to mention to you is that the poor nations are ill-equipped to properly process, store, or dispose of those imposed imported hazardous contaminants. The most glaring implication is that the majority world, the poorer nations, are becoming the contaminated dumping grounds of the richer nations' chemical waste. Their lands are becoming burial grounds of these lethal chemicals that threaten to leak out and in some cases are already leaking out into the ecosystem of these countries. Under the guise of social, and the third one is that under the guise of social improvement and economic revitalization, poorer nations accept these loads of toxics because it is one way in which they can generate some income or pay off some of the external national debt. debt. Additionally, under the rationale of creating or generating jobs and contributing to the recycling of metals, such as gold and copper, you will recall the recent um, Olympic Games, and Japan prided itself that all of its metals came from recycled, recycled material, gold, silver, and copper, and bronze, sorry. But what becomes very in interesting for me is that these workers often come into contact with toxic waste without protective gear. Until recently, UU China was the largest e-waste dumped with 700,000 tons of trash, economic, trash electronics per year. Have you thrown a television? Have you wondered where it ended up? What often does not get the light of day is that in some of these recycling nations, the recycling of e-waste is closely linked to child labor. Let me just mention a side note here. The UK is one of the worst offenders in exporting electronic waste to poorer nations. At home, within the richer nation's territories, it has been proven by a wide range of environmental studies, the factories which contaminate the environment and the waterways are often located in areas where there are large concentrations of racialized people. In the USA, minoritized people are 79% more likely to, to live close to factories and production plants that contaminate the air, particularly the case around factories that deal with petroleum or coal industries. A study after study shows that plants which produce high levels of contaminant into the earth, be it into the air or the waterways, are located where racialized communities often live. And if you know, don't know, but more chances are you do, these, those toxics cause illnesses such as respiratory diseases, cancer, miscarriages, and a host of other negative health effects. In Canada, where I live, it is among the first nations, the Métis and the Inuit, that an inordinate amount of these factories or greater exposure to hazard materials can be found. The intersection between the primacy, primacy of economics versus the well-being of indigenous peoples and the destruction and or protection of the environment becomes clear recently here in Canada in the accommodation agreement between Nova Scotia and the Wolaskijik peoples, who proposed an open pink tungsten and molybdenum mining operation on their, on their unceded territory. Indeed, 
Often the justification of exposure to industrial pollutants by specific racialized peoples and communities is explained away as part of the social cost that brings the benefit of industrial employment opportunities. But here I want to affirm together with, with James Scone that if toxic waste is not enough to be dumped in the richer nations, it is also not safe enough to be dumped in Ghana, in Liberia, in Somalia, in Vietnam, and in India, and nowhere and, and nor anywhere else in the world. In light of all this stuff that I just show you, then for me, one question stands. What do the rising sea levels in the Asia Pacific, the nickel mines in El Salvador and Guatemala, and the growing erosion of the available rainforest in the Amazon have in common? The glaring answer is that most of those places are in the global south. The people of those regions do not have the recourse to find a solution or to relocate and leave or migrate elsewhere. Another aspect they have in common is that it is the rest of the world, what I call the racialized world, who are most impacted by such destructive activities of the, in the, of the environment. And here's where it hits home for me. In the words of James Cohn again, if we are, quote, to achieve environmental justice, the environment in urban ghettos, barrios, reservations, and rural poverty pockets must be given the same protection as that provided to the servers, end quote. The point I am trying to make is that it is increasingly evident that the racialized and minoritized peoples have a greater share in the exposure of pollutants and that their share of pollution risk greatly exceeds the benefits for their share of employment or other economic benefits of local communities to local communities or to neighboring communities, which depend on the waterways for their livelihood as well as their sustenance. Relatedly, the environmental destruction actions spearheaded by the global north are not unrelated by the geopolitical tentacles of economic power by the richer nations and which have no consideration for the rest of the majority world. These foci of environmental despoliation are also leaving a trail of trash in the richer nations where burial sites for chemicals and production plants that contaminate the environment are still operating. So I want to propose to you that this legacy of environmental destruction is part of the larger destructive legacy of the Western European and Anglo North Atlantic colonial project and its present day coloniality to which I now turn. I'm gonna go a little bit, um, now this is gonna be short, okay? So you can breathe. The legacy of colonization, or what I wanna start calling as eco-racism, eco is but an extension of social racism and racialization of peoples. It is the legacy of the logic of colonization, including a structuring of the world along the lines of racial, gender, and classes social markers. 1492, it stands in the annals of history as the point of departure when talking about the emergence of the Western European and Anglo North Atlantic colonial project. The sequence of, event, of events that led to the colonization of the America rested not so much on the superiority of the Europeans as the welcome spirit and naivety of the indigenous communities they encounter when they arrived. Western Europeans did have superior weaponry and much more sophisticated strategies of military aggression. But the writings of Christopher Columbus, 
Bernal Díaz del Castillo, and Garcilaso de la Vega, to name but a few, help us see how the Incas, the Naguas, the Mayas, the Aztecs, the Chipchas, and other indigenous groups welcomed them with no apparent malice, but quickly woke up to the realization that they had been deceived. Garcilaso de la Vega tells us how the indigenous were scared and astounding that the new guests had sticks that spat fire and how 50 indigenous men were not enough to bring down a soldier on a horse. In other words, there was a cultural shock. However, we want to interpret the encounter between the Europeans and the indigenous communities. It remains important to highlight that two critical detrimental effects emerge that until now continue to impact global geopolitics and which are directly connected to ecological issues and concerns. Upon facing the native population of the Americas and everywhere they went, the Europeans failed to see the full humanity of the local peoples. Deeply influenced by the recovery of the Iberian Peninsula from the Arabs and is still informed by, this, by the attitudes and sentiments of the war against Jews and Muslims, the Spanish and subsequent Europeans saw themselves as heirs to a superior humanity. And I mean superior in a biological sense. Accounts of their colonizing exploits often depicted Europeans as superhuman biblical characters. Inevitably, though motivated by the Christian religious zeal, Europeans also failed to value indigenous cultural and religious traditions. But the inability to see the indigenous peoples as equal human beings led to indiscriminate mass killings, raping of indigenous women, and destruction of indigenous cultural and religious traditions. In many ways, such behavior and its negative impacts on the indigenous was considered a necessary cost for the more civilized European elder sibling to elevate the humanity of the indigenous. You see the contradiction? In the words of Juan Quines, Yes, thank you. Oh, I thought I was. <laughs> never mind. No, that's, yeah. not that's brothers. So. Yeah, yeah. I thought I thought you were telling me. Do remember that there are questions on the chat. <laughs> anyway, in the words of one minute de Sepulveda, those who die are a small price when compared to the enormous benefits we are bringing to the indigenous of civilizing them and for them to receive Christianity. Indeed, though often Bartolomé de las Casas is credited with the defense of the indigenous people and responsible for the new laws of Spain of 1542, which declare indigenous people free from slavery, we also know that las Casas had indigenous slaves when he was an encomendero. Another important detail in de las Casas is that he also promoted that Africans be brought and for them to take pl the place of the indigenous people contributing to ideas of, his, of African slavery. As African slaves were brought to the Americas, it happened because these populations were already considered subhuman and in many places are still considered subhuman. So the ensuing transatlantic slave, as Paul Gilroy calls it, became a most profitable system of economics predicated on the commodification of African humans. We know similar dehumanization of peoples took place as Europeans, Germans, Italians, British, Dutch, German, Danish, and I am missing a few, went out to conquer the world and encountered a wide array of endoracial indigenous groups. Anywhere they went, social structures of endoracial stratifications of people along with corresponding social, political, and endoracial structures of exploitation were set in place. White Europeans located themselves at the top of the social, ethno-racial, political, cultural, and religious ladder, while assigning variant values to authorized ethno-racial groups, cultures, religious traditions, 
including forcing them to serve their economic and religious interests. This legacy and residue of colonization, or what I call, I want to suggest to you, coloniality, is still operative in the way these richer nations work in the, with the global south. And those same structures of racialization and coloniality are operative in many societies in the global north and in the global south as well. And these same processes of commodification and thing, thingification of peoples are still operative today. The same colonial project, which destroyed many indigenous peoples and commodified and exploited many others, was also inspired by, not, by an ideology of the supremacy of humanity over the rest of creation. Land, nature, and all these resources were understood to be for the taking, for the possession of the Christian European invaders. As Enrique Dussel notes, ego conquiro, the I that conquers, preceded the ego cogito, the I that thinks. The doctrine of discovery was the ideology that gave the European the authority to claim any land with which they stumble and which was not inhabited or owned by Christian people. The principle was enshrined in Nicholas V, Tam Diversas. As Europeans were giving the seal of approval to take the lands anywhere they went, any lands they discovered and were not previously owned by other Christians. And consequently, to place the inhabitants into perpetual servitude. Such position was confirmed by Alexander IV Intercaetera, where he granted all the lands of today's Latin America to the Spanish and the Portuguese monarchs. And we could have spent a whole lot of time on how the church participated in granting the UK lands everywhere else. The land was conquered but so also were peoples and their bodies. The population became part of the new territories to be occupied and penetrated. And I'm using that language very intentionally. This discussion was part of the Valladolid debates in which it was determined that the inhabitants of the Americas had effectively become subjects of the Spanish crown. Another way to say everything that I've already said <laughs> is that the doctrine of discovery went hand in hand with Terra Nullius. Jean Locke reasoned that the land is made one's property when tended and cared for. In this second treaty, in his second treatise on government, he wrote that a conqueror could dispossess the land from the natives for two main reasons. First, because they have never held position of it, possession of it because they had no title. And second, because they did not tend or till the land. For all intents and purposes, he insisted the land was empty. It was terra nullius, or nobody's land, there for the taking by the European conquerors. So circling back then to our main question, what does this information about colonization and its logic of exploitation and commodification have to do with environment? That's the other side of the question with which I started. Through colonization, the Americas and other conquered lands in Asia and Africa quickly became the empty sources of great material resources to be extracted and commodified, whether gold, silver, animals, fruits, petroleum, and peoples. The colonial project put in place all the commercial structures of extractivism and exploitation of the lands non-renewable and renewable resources. Together with the commodification of human life, the colonial project enhanced Western European wealth at the expense of the rest of the world and continues to do so. But as I have noted, these dynamics also created the social, political, cultural, racialized, theological, intellectual, and economic structures that were used and continue to be used to exploit the world's resources. These structures are also used to justify the survival and expansion of the colonial project, to place the world's population into submission and to organize it hierarchically along racialized, racial lines. 
colonization clearly demonstrated that everything from land, nature, and life itself can be turned into a product of consumption and profit making. The worst effect of coloniality at work is the fact that some lives are ascribed a higher value than others. Within the present framework of coloniality and globalized structures of neoliberal capitalism, as its late, latest expression, questions of environmental concern, great, greater clarity, I want to suggest to you. Within the economic calculus, racialized lives are worth less than the lives of Western Europeans and Anglo North Atlantic. The disregard for the lives of former colonies is far too evident. Similarly, the lands where Europeans and their descendants occupy are worth protecting more than the lands inhabited by racialized communities in the majority world. In fact, exporting contaminated goods, chemicals, pollutants, and e waste and e waste to the global south effectively uncovers the fallacy and the hypocrisy of the West to work against environmental contamination and ecological change. Instead, the continuing invasion of the global north with environmental hazards merely shows that we are what we are experiencing is in fact the continuation of colonization. We can say that what, it, what, was, what at one point was only economic, military, cultural, and religious colonization has quickly shifted into environmental colonization. The legacy is obvious in what I'm describing to you as ecological racism, what Cohen identifies as green bigotry. And this is one way he, he puts it, quote, conservationists are more invested in saving the habitats of birds than in the construction of low-income houses, end quote. So you see the connection here then between caring for the world, but also caring for fellow humans. My point is simple. I want to suggest that it is not that the global North has finally awakened and decided to stop damaging the environment. It is not that there is a clear intentionality to refrain from producing toxic chemicals, pollutants, and to reduce greenhouse gases by 2050. This is a bit controversial. It is rather that the West, the governments, the richer nations have decided to cast, to cast their lot with the last bastion of colonization, namely economics. The gamble is to see how they can stretch their polluting regime throughout the rest of the world under the guise of seeking alternatives, even while not, significant, not significantly curbing their own modes of consumption and producing and production and not to slow their, their, their own national economies. Behind the rhetoric of some talks and negotiations are needed, these richer nations continue to leave a trail of contamination and not just in their backyard. Anyway, time's running up, and I'm sure Justin is going to tell me to shut up very quickly. So uh, before that, um, I'm just going to very quickly tell you this. This is going to be shorter. This moves me to the third section. And here I want to just start thinking about how, how can we rethink this? How can we think about it? And what I want to do is just um, far from regurgitating the colonial project and its trail of damage and destruction of humanity, which I have done enough already, my intention is to note that um, this residual coloniality stems from a critical theological, theological fragmentation between the earth and the rest of creation and humanity and between some human beings and others. There is a need to reorient our imagination away from seeing each other in terms of modernity's racialized hierarchies and colonization. The ethical limitation is to orient ourselves towards valuing each other as fellow co-workers in the struggle to curb climate change and to dismantle the structures of colonization and the residual coloniality that so governed our lives. Stated differently, the destruction of our fellow humans is deeply connected to the destruction of the world. Conversely, the destruction of the earth is an assault on humanity. In the words of Frank Hinskelammer, this is the, the cautionary message that I want to give you. 
we are cutting the branch on which we're sitting. Or in the words of Prince EA, EA we need to autocorrect. Theologically speaking, we're past affirming that Genesis 1, 26, 28 does not refer to humans having dominion over the earth. We're also past affirming that other fellow humans are also made in the image of God or that they also have the same human rights as those in the richer nations. To address the theological scaffold behind environmental despoliation and climate change, we need to also address the theological intellectual structures that contribute to the commodification of all forms of life, including human life. We cannot do that using the same ideas, frameworks, and tools that have brought us here. The master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. On that note, there are two terms that I want to leave to you quickly. The first one is buen vivir. Buen vivir, or good living, relates to ways of organizing society so that the earth and people are considered in mutual interrelationship. A social orientation where humanity is not considered above or the highest expression of what exists, but is recognized as deeply dependent on creation. There is also no hierarchy here, no but rather only in the interdependence between people and the earth and people with other people. Note, when Vivir does not mean to live well, according to how individuals determine what that means. It, also, it is also not the same as establishing a universal social common good as if all peoples have the same social needs. Instead, Buen Vivir is a collectively determined social and economic reorganization that allocates social and material goods and resources according to where they are needed, taking into consideration that some people might need more than others. Buen Vivir is designed not to bring equality, but justice, where the individual needs are collectively considered and the social obstacles are removed where communities, leaders, and elders make decisions in consultation and where the expected outcome is intimately linked to the entire community's well-being. So Buen Vivir is not motivated by unfettered accumulation of goods by anyone, nor is it regulated according to an individual sense of ownership of property to the exclusion of everyone else. Instead, land and its resources are not considered to be owned nor can anyone dispose of them without first taking into consideration the impact on the larger social context and population. Which leads me to the second concept, which is senti pensar. And that's why I gave the title to my talk. Here is where senti, uh, sorry, um, developed by the Afro-Colombian river people, and literally meaning feeling, thinking, sentipensar relates directly to the considerations on one's impact on the immediate natural context. Sentipensar corresponds with the reimagining of our interaction with each other and with the earth in ways that carefully reflect on people's impact on the earth and immediate ecosystem. Specific attention is given to our habits of consumption that end up damaging the earth. So senti pensar relates to the responsibility of each generation to care for the land and ensure subsistence for coming generations. The caveat is that caring for the land is not limited to one's own immediate lifetime, but rather one takes care of the land because it is not one's own. For the, it is rather for the sake of one's descendants seven generations later. Sentipensar is not predicated on the economic calculus of commodification or as the ultimate measure of what is worth. Instead, it is a safeguard against the seductive power of economics, recognizing the irreducibility of the earth, the land, and the people to the lowest common denominator of capital. 
There's a whole lot more that I could say, but I'm running out of time. I probably run out of time already. And you and Justin is too nice to to not shut me out. But uh, let me just leave with you. I wanted to I wanted you to hear a song, but it's too late now. And so I'm just going to give you the lyrics. It's a, it's a famous song uh, by Mercedes Sosa and Longi Echo. And, and here is my prayer. The title of the song is Solo Le Pido a Dios, I Only Ask God. I only ask God that I may not be indifferent to the pain of others, that the dry death does not find me empty and alone without having done enough. I only ask God that I may not be indifferent to justice, to injustice, that I may not be struck on the other cheek after a claw just scratched my good fortune. I only ask God that war may not be indifferent to me. It is a big monster that stomps on all the poor innocence of the people. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Nestor. That was uh, incredibly convicting, um, <clears throat> I think, for, uh, for a lot of us, for me, certainly. Um, we have about 22 Two minutes. minutes. <laughs> no, no, we got time, man. We got time. Um, to, uh, no, I, I think we go to a quarter past. So um, if you can stick oh, around. Oh, good. I'm good. happy. Yeah, yeah. Sorry um, about that. I wasn't sure about the timing. So, uh, yeah, we have time for questions. So put, do put them in the chat or use your little hand raising thing um, and we'll get some good discussion going. Um, if I could get us going, Nestor, um, so you have a, a really, um, you have an audience before you who's going to resonate, I think, a lot with what you said, but also feel pretty overwhelmed, I guess. Um, so you'll have people here that are involved in sort of activist groups and small community projects, obviously lots of people involved with church. So people that really, really want to make a difference. Uh, but now having heard your talk, we also recognize this sort of huge matrix and web of sort of problems that were, that are sort of hampering our ability to make a difference. Uh, mm -hmm. Capital and commodification and racialized identities and globalist ideology and all of that. For those of us that want to make a difference, like how do we um, sort of make the practical changes in our own contexts, the small changes, but also start working to sort of dismantle some of these systems to sort of decolonize our mentality? What do we do where we're at to sort of make a difference in these things? <laughs> okay. So I thought there was only two minutes. Okay. Um, and I say that in terms of how long do you have? Um, that is the, the $20 million question, right? And we are constantly find ourselves against the wall where we find both overwhelmed because what we do, we don't feel that it adds up. And on the other hand, the magnitude of the, of the complexity of the issues that we're wrestling with. I mean, so, so I, I, I get that. So in a simple way, I can say local, local movements and local actions do add up, right? But we can no longer continue thinking that our local engagement is all that is necessary. We can no longer continue thinking that as long as we address our only issues, as long as I only am uh, dealing with what is immediately next to me, I'm addressing all the issues. That is to, to an in individualistic approach. Because as I have emphasized, we are far too interconnected. The clothes that we wear, the books that we buy, not because you have a lot of books in the background, the, the, uh, the shoes that we walk on, the desk, the curtains, everything is interconnected with somewhere else. And learning to appreciate that interconnectivity means to also learning to work 
with interconnected networks in other places so that we no longer just do our thing here and, and to hell with the rest of the world because there is no, there won't be a world to live in if we don't connect with those, those places. But that will require, if we are thinking decolonization, it re will require that we dismantle our own attitudes about the rest of the world. It will require also that we dismantle our own assumptions about the rest of the world and about our, ourselves. And it will also require that we dismantle our own privilege that has been granted to us by colonization, whichever it may be. You don't need to be uh, uh, white in order to have privilege, right? And, and by that, I mean Euro, European of European descent. And so I think that before we start thinking about what do we do, right, which is the, the hysteria, what do we do? We first begin to think about what have we done? Do an inventory. What have we done and, what, and, and where else can we find connections? resonances across the world, because I am sure there are, I can tell you there are, and then begin to make those points of connections and networks. And that is, for me, one of the best ways to begin to do that. Hope that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So how do you, <clears throat> how do you sort of, because we're in climate crisis now, right? So how do you prioritize what your activism is? Because obviously the white whale is, destroy the capitalist system, you know, and all of that, uh, completely decolonize our mentality, <clears throat> uh, learn from indigenous wisdom, kind of reverse 500 years of European destruction, et cetera. But in the meantime, as you pointed out in the beginning part of your presentation, there are neighborhoods in the global south that are getting flooded and there's hurricanes destroying people's livelihood. Do, do, can we afford to sort of wage these ideological battles when, you know, physical lives are at stake because of the climate crisis? Like, how do you- balance? Right. I, I actually, let me turn and flip it on its head. We cannot not afford, we must afford them. <laughs> because Precisely because other people's lives are at stake. Those people are suffering precisely because of the neglect and, and just, you know, the global West and the populations have said, well, you know, it's not our backyard. We really don't have anything to do with that. So we might as well just chill out and enjoy our what we have and, and, and don't care about the rest of the world. So I don't think I don't think it's a question of whether we must we 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 could afford it, but rather we must engage it because otherwise then we're just maintaining the status quo. And that is something that I I I just can't can 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 do right yeah that's great um well scary but uh, good answer um got a question from emily about the idea of the promised land emily do you want to say that uh, in your own words yeah sure i think one of the things i've been really wrestling with in the last couple of years as i've been thinking about a kind of theology of land is so much in the bible that talks about promising land to people and, and this moving from Abraham as a, as a refugee in exile, being taken from having no land and being promised, and all the kind of genocide and killings that come from that, and, you know, seeing that play out in history in so many different ways. And that's something that I really wrestle with, um, and how do we kind of hold such a big biblical motif and theme in the context of today with him? that has not just in specifically kind of holy land politics but more generally this idea of promised land you know it's a difficult question but it is a, it is a difficult question because i i just don't want to be burned at the stake you know i don't want to end up uh <laughs> but let me just say this that before uh no let me let me let me see it this way there are at least three other types of theologies of land in the Bible other than the promised land. And it is important for us to think about that. And, it, and so the, there is the, the, the land as a deposit, as the place that God created 
and God looked at and God felt pleasure out of that result and said, oh, this is good, man. This is like amazing. This, I've done a really good thing. I mean, I really need a pat in the back. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a theology of land that we don't often talk about. Okay. There is also a theology of land, uh, of land that there were other peoples around, neighboring peoples, and that those people were somehow able to coexist. That doesn't, that doesn't quite register in our churches, in our theologies. And what we don't often think about, well, maybe all of you do, but I don't, is, 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 is that the theology of the promised land comes predicated on conquest and invasion. And it is the same theology that was used when when the Europeans went everywhere else. And that idea of the promised land, Dan, the land that flows with milk and honey. Incidentally, I don't know if you read the text lately, when the people of Israel talked about, you know, when they were in the desert, they were wondering and they were all like, what the hell, why did, why didn't Moses bring us out here? We're going to die. They said, why did we not stay in Egypt, a land that flows with milk and honey? And I thought, oh, interesting. I thought it was only the land of Israel that flows with milk and honey. And the whole use of the, of the term milk and honey is because there isn't a place of abundance where you can plant, where you can, when you can live off the land. That's a theology of land there that we haven't talked about, that we are not exploring. And so we need to understand that if anything has done evangelicalism and traditional messianic approaches of, to Christianity have done is to center the theology of the promised land and decenter all the other theologies of the land that are intrinsic to the biblical text as well. And that it is important for us to reclaim those theologies of land too. I mean, remember this. It was, it was, it was. David, who said, the heavens declare the glory of God. And the land, I mean, he's talking about the trees and the mountains. That's a theology of land. Sorry for his yelling. I get excited and I just, you know, I become a preacher. But, um, but that's that we need to really think about what aspects of the land are we talking about. Hope that makes, you know, respond somewhat, somewhat Amy. Um, we've got a question, well, a comment from Lynn that raises a question for me. She says, um, our friend in the Highlands of Papua New Guinea still expressed gratitude for the gospel education and medicine, I assume, as a result of interactions with the West. And they're only just waking up to the cost of those things to their own culture. So I wonder if you could talk a bit about, because um, I think sometimes in, in this discussion, you sort of can present those that are oppressed as sort of these sort of sage-like figures that if only we would listen to them, they would solve all their problems and sometimes forget that like everybody is caught up in a victimization of this whole system. How do we, uh, if you were giving this talk, maybe not to us, um, culp us culprits in the West, but to the victims of, of eco-racism, like how would you sort of evangelize them to these things, to wake up to, to their sort of place as common. Well, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's a great question. In interesting way of asking. But um, um, first, I am not thinking we should be going back to some idyllic moment, yeah. uh, a romantic moment. Uh, you know, this is like Genesis or when everything was nice and we all were harmoniously, that's not, I, I don't think that's even possible. And I don't think that ever was true, but, but, but that's just my, me. Uh, and, and second, um, I also don't want to idealize uh, indigenous communities, not by a long shot or any other community for that matter. I think every cultural and no racial community has their own issues to address and their own concerns. 
and and because of that, um, I wouldn't try to quote unquote evangelize them. What I would do, however, is is raise the fact that all of us are implicated in this new situation. All of us, regardless of where we are. Unfortunately, though, I also need to identify the power differential and the economic differential that is monumentally larger. And, and in that sense, not necessarily in the spirit of ascribing guilt, but in the spirit of ascribing responsibility. There are many indigenous communities that are wrestling with these questions and that they haven't been wrestling with these questions. Uh, they haven't started wrestling with these questions 20 years ago. These are millennia old ideas, senti pensar and, and when vivir. These are not recent. We are just finding them out because they're speaking about it. So it's important for us to not idealize them, but also, uh, also for me at least, to know that this is my ancestral knowledge that I am, you know, I, I, I'm learning from and offering to you. But I'm also aware that there are a whole lot of things that need and, and must be critiqued and engaged. And in terms of people from Papua New Guinea or 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 Cusco, Peru, or whatever, uh, who are saying, you know. The, the gospel came and, and changed our lives. Great. I do believe the gospel can change people's lives. I do believe the gospel can bring a whole lot of life-giving ways of engaging. But I also need to keep my feet on the ground and know that it was the Christian message, that the theology that played a central role in justifying colonization and I cannot I cannot ignore that um, we have a, a whole bunch of comments that I'm working hard in my brain to try to convert into questions um, in the chat but for those that did make comments if you wanted to sort of chime in and engage Nestor this is your chance to do so so um, otherwise I'm going to start babbling I think I might be doing that now uh, any comments or questions uh, that you'd like to pose? Um, uh, right, okay, well, prepare yourself for another Justin question then. Um, so what's, what's like the good news in all of this, like specifically from a Christian perspective? Um, I mean, I, uh, I think a lot of us in the room have been, um, have read and have been impacted by Willie Jennings stuff where he sort of ends with this flurry of, there's an alternative vision that the Christian gospel offers that is the opposite of all this kind of commodification and use of racialized minorities as resources for economic projects and all that. Like what's your, does Christianity have some kind of gospel to offer? in a context like the one we're living in, this, this colonial matrix. What do we say? Ooh. My sh short answer is yes. Phew. Yeah. Um, really listen, I, otherwise I would not be a Christian, okay? Yeah. I would already jump ship. Um, I believe that the gospel, more than any other tradition, invites me to learn, to, to strive for the dignity of, of creation and for the dignity of my fellow humans. I think there is something intrinsic to the gospel message that invites me to even, nece if necessary, to offer myself up for them, for their well-being. And that is unique to the gospel. That is totally unique to the gospel. So there is, a, there is you could say, a, a salvific character. There's an, even a soteriological character to me loving my neighbor. 
as myself. But for some reason, in order, if we are going to affirm that, we need to also emphasize that there is something about the gospel that has been corrupted and that is corrupted by colonization and that it is corrupted by individualism, the hyper-individual character of the I, that the cogito ergo sum, right? The I that thinks and that that defines me and realize that the gospel, in fact, invites us to relationship, to relationship with each other, and that we cannot fully be humans, and we cannot even be defined as human beings unless we are in relationship. But in the same way, when I mean relationship, I mean relationship with others, but also relationship with the earth, by, with my immediate world, with my immediate context. There is something about humanity that cannot be, is not solipsistic. It does, I am not the sole center of what, what I am. In fact, there is something far greater. This whole cloud of witnesses, Hebrews 11, this whole range of people that I have relationships with that are the ones that move me towards a fuller humanity. And in the words of Paul, until we reach the full statue, stature of Jesus Christ. There is something about relationships that Christianity brings and offers us that is unique to it and that has profound ethical implications to how we ought morality, right? The ethics ought to live our lives. I hope that makes sense. Wow. Um, oh, man, there's a great question that just came. Oh, gosh, everything is writing in now. Uh, but we're running out of time. Um, so, uh, that was great. I if uh, I kind of feel like I want to make every head bowed and every eyes closed and do an altar call right now um, because I'm ready to enlist in that project that you just described. Um, uh, thank you so much, Nestor. We have to uh, end here, but before we do, we've been asking all our speakers if there's ways that we can pray for you and your ministry uh, here at TST and all the other stuff you do with First Nations. So how can we pray for you? And then we'll do that. You know, uh, my goodness. Yeah, pray that I may may have the wisdom, the language to communicate. Um, it's a lot easier to speak about these issues in Spanish. Believe me, I can just, you know. <laughs> so. Uh, uh, so, so that I can, I have the wisdom, I can have the right words, and also have the the openness to to listen to perspectives that are different from mine or different from the one that I'm trying to promote as part of my tradition. I believe that only in conversation we yeah. look, we can move further. Um, let's pray together. Uh, Lord Jesus, uh, we pray for uh, Nestor and his ministry here in Toronto and Canada and around the world. Pray especially that you'd give him the gift of articulation and prophetic power in his speaking and teaching and preaching. That he would be able to connect uh, this grand vision of reconciliation and interdependence that is given to us in Jesus Christ. And he'd be able to communicate that and through that to dismantle these systems of oppression um, that we suffer under and that we uh, illegitimately serve. Free us from those things and please use Nestor as a tool of liberation. Pray in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, thanks again, Nestor. Uh, brilliant talk. Really, really appreciate that. Uh, lots to think of. We have a 15 minute break and then we have some more lovely workshops beginning at 4.30. So take a break, have a brew um, and come back and we'll continue to think and reflect on these issues together. So thanks again, Nestor, really appreciate it.